Uh, welcome everyone. This is uh, workshop one, effect of CFTR modulator therapy on infection inflammation in CF. Uh, I am Emanuela Bruscia. I am an associate professor in the Department of Pediatric at Yale University. And my co-chair, uh, Raul Rascon, is a junior investigator at the uh, CF Research Center at Nationwide Children's Hospital at Columbus, uh, Ohio. So uh, this is our disclosure and uh, what we are discussing today uh, during this workshop. We are in the era, era of highly effective CFTR modulator therapies, and those are drugs that have changed the landscape of CF disease. And there, there has been a tremendous effort from many investigators across the globe in uh, uh, following patients that are uh, starting the treatment with uh, highly effective CFTR modulator therapy and trying to understand how those drugs are changing the progression of the disease. And so what we have learned so far, uh, definitely from the patients that uh, are, they tolerate the, the medications, the drugs, those, uh, the CFTR effective, uh, effective CFTR modulator have improved many clinical aspects of the disease, starting from better lung function, fewer uh, pulmonary exacerbations, and very important, they increase the quality of life and median age of survival from those patients. However, however, at least in the adult population, it's also clear that uh, the CFTR modulator therapy does not fully eradicate uh, infections. And, uh, and therefore, there is still a non-resolving lung inflammation that is ongoing in those patients. And I guess that it is a common uh, uh, desire and a common uh, idea that those are, uh, those are aspects of the disease that still need to be um, addressed. So what we, uh, the objectives of this workshop will be to discuss some of the latest research and clinical funding on infections dynamics and host response in patients undergoing CFTR modulator therapy. Uh, to, we will dig a little bit into the molecular mechanism of, of CFTR modulator therapy on infection and inflammation. And then uh, we will discuss the impact of CFTR modulator therapy on immune cell function. And this is the lineup of our fantastic five speakers. We will start from Stacy Martignano at Children's Hospital Colorado, and she will discuss how highly effective modulator therapy is impacting NTM infections in those patients. And uh, th this will be followed by Samantha Durfee. She is at Emory University. She will present some of the work that she, she did during her PhD at the University of Washington, looking at ATI effects on regional lung infection and inflammation. Lara Schupp is uh, joining us from the Charité University of Berlin, and she will discuss her effort of using bioinformatics to dig into the large amount of data that are coming out from the longitudinal uh, studies um, and looking at the effect of ATI on sputum microbiome and the proteome. The last two uh, talks will be dedicated at um, metabolism and uh, uh, Raul Rascon from Nationwide Children's Hospital will, dis will discuss ETI metabolic shift on CF neutrophil and Yang Tzu Chen uh, from Columbia University will uh, conclude the sections by discussing how highly effective modulator therapy are uh, changing lung cell metabolism. So. Um, we will have about eight minutes for, uh, uh, after each um, uh, presentation for questions. There are two ways that you can ask your question. You can walk in the center of the room and use the micro microphone, or you can use your mob mobile app. Please uh, try to send all the questions during, uh, during the talk, so we will have time he up here to look at them. Uh, another. Uh, news, uh, we do not have a working timer, so we will keep the timer uh, on our cell phone and we will tell you guys when the time is running out, okay? Thank you so much, and uh, let's welcome our first speaker, Stacy Martignano from Children's Hospital Colorado, title of the ta talk, Reduction in Positive Culture for NTM and Pulmonary Disease in People with CF in the Era of Highly Effective Modulator Therapy among Participants in the Longitudinal Predict Studies. 
It is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so ask. Well, thank you. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Glad to start the meeting with a bang. Oh, look, I got a lot of participation today. Um, so thank you to the um, organizers for inviting me to present our study and our data. I'll be presenting on behalf of my uh, co-PI, Dr. Jerry Nick, and the investigators of the CF Foundation NTM Consortium. Um, my disclosure is that I receive CF Foundation funding for this study. So a bit of background about non-tuberculous mycobacteria, or NTM. These, these uh, bacteria are, at this point, really well-known pathogens in people with cystic fibrosis. And after an initial infection, clinical outcomes are variable. Um, and so some, some people with CF and get an initial NTM infection may just have a transient infection, so a single positive culture with um, follow-up cultures that are negative. Some participants and people with CF have more of an indolent infection where they may have um, repeated positive cultures but really no evidence of clinical impact. And then finally, there are certainly people with CF who get NTM and have positive cultures and evidence of pulmonary disease. Typically, they have associated clinical decline, they meet microbiologic, radiographic, and clinical criteria for disease, and ultimately require treatment. Now, since the approval of what I'll refer to as the two highly effective modulator therapies, or HEMT, including Ivacaftor, which was approved initially in January 2012, as well as Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, or ETI, which was initially approved in the U.S. in October 2019, we have seen that various studies and case series and reports, as well as data from the USCF Foundation Patient Registry, or the CFFPR, have both described reduced both individual sputum pathogen density and also reduced population prevalence of many common CF pathogens. And we'll hear more about some of those pathogens in data today. But just for example, um, within that CF pa patient registry, 10.3% of the population of people with CF in the U.S. had a positive NTM culture in 2022, which is down from 14% in 2019. So for our study, we aim to determine the impact of highly effective modulator therapy on NTM infection and also pulmonary disease diagnosis rates among our well-defined NTM saturated population in the PREDICT study, all of whom have had a recent history of a positive NTM culture. And we hypothesized that as more of our participants were started on highly effective modulator therapy, the rates of NTM sputum positivity and NTM pulmonary disease diagnoses would decrease. So we um, looked at NTM culture results and evaluated and summarized them for all participants enrolled in our PREDICT study. And for those starting on highly effective modulator therapy, either Ivacaftor or ETI during the study, those who had at least one day of follow-up, we compared among that cohort the prevalence of positive NTM cultures from the first positive culture recorded to the initiation of mod modulator therapy to the prevalence of positive cultures from the start of modulator therapy up to present. And we have a long longitudinal um, data set for this. Or until that participant did ultimately meet a diagnosis criteria of pulmonary disease. We also looked at the annual rates of NTM pulmonary disease diagnosis for the whole population and then compared among those on or off modulator therapy. So I wanted to talk a bit more about the PREDICT study. The PREDICT study stands for the Prospective Evaluation of NTM Disease in Cystic Fibrosis Trial. And this is a prospective multi-center observational study. It began in Colorado in 2013 at Children's Hospital Colorado and National Jewish Health and is currently enrolling at 19 sites across the U.S. that form the, the CF Foundation NTM Consortium. And what PREDICT does is it provides a standardized approach to evaluating people with positive NTM cultures to make that NTM pulmonary disease diagnosis. And we do this within the clinical care setting and provide guided microbiologic, radiographic, and clinical assessments for the team to follow for their participant and really make sure they're optimizing CF care. 
and we include people with CF only. Um, they have to be six years and older and at least have produced sputum or could participate in sputum induction. They cannot have a prior solid organ or stem cell transplant, and they must have a recent positive NTM culture of a species that's never been treated. So we're really looking at more of an initial infection and following those participants forward. So here's a schematic um, showing what the PREDICT NTM pulmonary disease diagnostic approach is. So on the left, you see you enroll in PREDICT if you've had a recent positive NTM culture. And then within the clinic, we um, have a series of clinical assessments, again, evaluating for microbiologic, radiographic, and clinical evidence of pulmonary disease. We have guidance on how to optimize their CF care. And then all the way throughout, we're collecting specimens um, for biomarker discovery. And um, if the participant does not meet disease criteria, they remain in the study and continue on for um, longitudinal follow-up. And so participants who are in that longitudinal follow-up may just have a single positive culture or they may have more indolent infection. But certainly there are a good number of our participants that do ultimately um, get diagnosed with pulmonary disease and they're oft offered um, an option to enroll in the patient's trial, which is an open label treatment trial following guidelines-based care. And so um, just to note that we do um, recommend and attempt sputum collection for NTIM culture at each clinical visit, which is typically on a quarterly basis, and we are obtaining all clinical data and recording that data. And then also beginning in 2023, we began providing a home sputum culture kit um, on an annual basis to the family to take home or to the participant as an adult to take home and, and mail in a sputum culture. And this provides an added opportunity for sputum collection and NTM culture. So just highlighting this is a more saturated population with ample opportunity to produce sputum. Um, so here is our enrollment to date. This is showing number of subjects over the years of the study. We've been doing the study and enrolling since 2014. And you can see initially in Colorado, we had um, up to about 50 participants expanded to 10 sites with increase in, in enrollment and then now um, enrolling at 19 sites. And we have had some lulls during, um, certainly during the COVID pandemic, but even recently are still enrolling in this study with people, again, who've had a recent positive culture. So in total, we've um, enrolled 304 participants with NTM um, and CF. A bit about their demographics. At this time, 63% of our participants are female. Um, regarding lung function at time of enrollment, the median lung function measured by FEV1 is 78%, and the median enrollment age is 30 years old, but I will highlight that 20% of our population are pediatric and less than or equal to 18 years old. From an NTM perspective, that we are typically enrolling participants with mycobacterium avium complex. At this time, about 60% of our population has uh, MAC, and about 40% have mycobacterium abscessus infection um, or perhaps a dual infection. So some of these participants have both abscesses and MAC. So first wanted to highlight um, how much if at all sputum are our patients part, um, providing. There has certainly been concern that with modulator therapy, our patients are unable to produce sputum, especially in the research setting. So here are just some um, overview data about sputum production, both from the CF Foundation National Patient Registry and also from the PREDICT study. So um, <clears throat> from the registry perspective, 71.2% of people in the registry had at least one sputum. Here I go again. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm producing sputum right now, it seems. Um, had at least one um, sputum culture sent in 2022. And this is a figure from the um, CF registry report showing percentage of individuals by age and looking at the amount um, of participants who produce sputum. And you can see that sputum production rates increase with age, which is expected. And once you're at about 20 years of age, the majority of people do produce at least one sputum culture. 
Um, and then appropriately, that uh, majority also had at least one NTM culture sent in that year. And I will say that this data is very similar to our PREDICT cohort, at least from a cross-sectional perspective. 74% of our participants had at least one NTM culture sent in 2024. Here are the data summarizing our NTM culture positivity rate, um, looking at all data and then pre-post modulator therapy in PREDICT. So prior to ETI availability, our historic culture positivity rate for all the participants in the PREDICT study was 37%. So 37% of the time, cultures were positive. We had a subset of our population, 72 subjects, who had data available both before and after starting one of the highly effective modulator therapies, either IVACAFTER or ETI. And what you can see, this is a figure showing the percent of positive cultures for NTM, both before and after ETI in this, in this, um, in this cohort. And you can see that majority of the population had a decline in the um, percent of cultures that were positive for NTM. And so um, specifically culture positivity rates decreased from 39% to 11% with a median difference of minus 28%. And then here are data showing the proportion of our PREDICT participants diagnosed with NTM pulmonary disease. Overall, among the whole cohort, um, we have diagnosed 25% um, of the participants over the length of the study with pulmonary disease, and again, that's from 2013 to present. We have seen similar rates of NTM pulmonary disease diagnosis in participants with MAC and with abscesses. And I will say that we have seen that NTM pulmonary disease rates have declined in recent years. So here are summary data for, again, this proportion of PREDICT participants diagnosed with pulmonary disease per year among those at risk. So here is a figure showing that um, prevalence per year on an annualized basis for all participants. And you can see that initially from 2013 up till 2018, we had consistent diagnoses of pulmonary disease among our cohort with positive cultures. And then starting you know, in 2018, 2019, we did see a decline in the annual rate of pulmonary disease diagnosis. And on average, um, for all participants, we have a rate of about 9% per year. But when we separate that by those who were started on highly effective modulator therapy, you can see that this decline in prevalence is really driven by those on modulator therapy. So if we separate those without modulator therapy, which started majority in, in, in the majority of our population around 2018, 2019, you can see those who are not on modulator therapy, meaning just not available or intolerant, they are still meeting disease criteria and having diagnoses versus the majority majority of those on modulator therapy have very few um, prevalence of diagnoses. Now that number is not zero. Um, we are still making diagnoses of pulmonary disease in those on modulator therapy, but certainly the rate is much lower at about two and a half percent per year. So here's just a summary of some of the data I just showed, um, looking at NTM data among our PREDICT participants. So um, for those not on modulator therapy, looking at historic data, our NTM culture positivity rates are about 39%. And now with um, people on highly effective modulator therapy, those culture positivity rates are now 11%. If we look at the average annual prevalence of NTM pulmonary disease diagnoses, we're at 11.3% for those not on modulator therapy, and that has gone to 2.5% for those on modulator therapy. And then if you really kind of combine all of our data at this longitudinal cohort, the total prevalence of pulmonary disease among the participants never or not started on modulator therapy, which was 113 participants, was 55%. And if we look at those who did start modulator therapy, now 191 participants, our overall percent um, of those with diagnoses are 8% or close to 8%. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, in the era of highly effective modulator therapy, people with CF are still producing sputum and being infected with NTM. 
And we do feel that NTM continues to be a pathogen, but sputum positivity and NTM pulmonary disease diagnosis rates have decreased among our, the people on highly effective modulator therapy. We suspect that NTM is harder to detect due to reduced sputum frequency and volumes and also reduced bacterial burden. And we also think that the NTM pulmonary disease clinical syndrome is more subtle when on modulator therapy. And just want to highlight that continued partnerships between basic translational scientists and existing clinical studies, such as ours and others, as well as the NTM National Resource Centers are critical for the development of novel and more sensitive diagnostic and outcome markers for this population. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our full predict and patient study team, um, especially our Colorado team um, with uh, Jerry Nick, my co-PI, and our excellent research coordinators, Allie Keck and Valerie Lovell, and then our full team, and especially those at the TDN Clinical um, Coordinating Center, our advisory committee, and those investigators, coordinators, and patients at the CF and TAM Consortium. And with that, I'll take questions. Are there any questions from the floor? Okay. So we have a couple of questions on the, uh, the so app. We had a couple of questions here in the app. Uh, the first one is from Alexander Stuffer. Do you plan to eventually roll patients that have received the latest modulative therapies for early childhood to see infection rates or a lack of since or lack of since they've been on therapy since early age? Um, so we plan to evaluate that? Is that the question? Yes, certainly. And um, I did not highlight this data, but we actually have an from an overall population perspective, even though only 20% of our population are pediatric, we are actually seeing higher pulmonary disease diagnosis rates in that population. Um, and so we certainly, it's a little bit earlier for them to know what the impact of modulator therapy will be, but we'll definitely be looking at that. Hi, okay, Stacy. Like, excellent talk. Um, can you break down if you saw differences between different species of mycobacteria um, post hemp that was before? Oh, thank you for that. I actually um, do not have that. Um, the breakdown of those who have less positive cultures of MAC versus obsessus. I will say that the we have similar rates of disease. And so that would be interesting to look at if we're seeing more or less clearance depending on the bacteria. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Hi, Julian Fulton from Cardiff. Um, we've all got this problem, haven't we, about um, the quality of the sample that we obtain defining outcomes for all of our studies. Um, were these spontaneously expectorated sputums or was this sputum induction? Um, because I think many people in the room will um, contest your statement that everybody is still producing sputum. Yeah, the majority are um, spontaneously expectorated sputum. Um, I think, and I do think just from our samples, the majority are collected not necessarily at the clinic appointment. Um, I think a lot of our ability to collect sputum are from providing a lot of different avenues to produce sputum. And so as part of the study, patients have, I didn't mention this, but they have sputum cups at home to collect with exacerbations. Um, and we also, have this home mailer kit where people cannot just drop off sputum but actually mail it back. Um, we were doing more induced sputums um, earlier in the study, but with the COVID pandemic and more regulation around that, generally speaking across our centers, that has gone uh, quite a bit down. And so I, I think that the number of sputum produced is less, but there is at least um, a single sample at, at a minimum in most people. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's something to keep in mind for clinical purposes and then for studies rolling out where sputum and culture um, is still anchored around that sputum result. Being as creative as possible, building that into your budget, adding opportunities to collect sputum, I think is really important. 
Hi, I just uh, thank you so much for a nice talk. Um, I just was curious about the comparison the folks on high uh, effective modulators versus not, and the graphs that seem to look parallel uh, in the you know 2019, 2018 with them both dropping, and I just wondered what that was about, if you had any ideas. Yeah, I, I didn't have the total numbers, and so there's much more variability later on. Now over 70% of our participants are on modulators now, so that frequency curve is tighter versus we do see more variability in those not on modulator therapy, and I think that's just due to the lower numbers of people not on modulator therapy, the error bars are bigger. So we have another question here from Rachel Rayner. It says, for the 11% who still tested positive for NTM post ETI, do you know how well those patients responded to ETI? And is there a correlation between treatment response slash lung function and reduction of NTM? Yeah, thank you for that. I don't have that data at this time, but that's certainly um, what we suspect is that um, we have um, quality and we have um, CFQR or um, kind of clinical um, data, we have lung function data, we have um, weight, BMI, that type of data as well. So really correlating what we suspect is those clinically responding are also showing um, more, less, excuse me, less positive um, cultures, but that is something we're looking to evaluate and, and publish. Thank you. Okay. And we have another one here in, from Drake Bozak. Uh, is clearance of MTM in the individuals on HMT related to spontaneous clearance, lack of sputum availability, response, response to eradica eradication therapy, or a little of each? Uh, I'll go a little of each. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we are, you know, in a subset trying to look at some of that um, more quantitative data. Um, from a, a high level population, we just have the um, more like qualitative, um, a number of culture positivity. So, but I do suspect it's it's a bit of both. Harder to find and less burden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steffi, for an excellent presentation. And, and let's uh, welcome our second speaker, Samantha Durfee from Emory University. The title, title of her talk is Multilobe Bronchoscopy Reveals ATI effects on regional lung infection and inflammation. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for being here and thank you for being here so early in the morning. Um, my name is Sam Durfee and I'm excited to have the opportunity to tell you about my PhD work where we used multi-lobe bronchoscopy to show that post-ETI infections Oh, you can't hear. Oh. Thank you. That would have been very bad. Thank you. Uh, so I'm very excited to tell all of you today about the PhD work I did where we used multi-lobe bronchoscopy to show that post-ETI infections affect all lung regions within subjects and drive persistent inflammation. Yeah. Okay. So we were really interested in why infections and inflammation persist after ETI, and one lung characteristic that we thought could contribute was intralung heterogeneity. So for example, I'm showing a lung here of a person from a person with CF where you have an area of high damage and an area of low damage. And we thought that these highly damaged regions could be the sites of persistent infection because of impaired mucus clearance, dampened immune responses, or higher bacterial density. Most importantly, sites of lung damage can get infected in non-CF lung diseases, and removing those damaged regions can cure infection. And so this connection between lung damage and infection in non-CF lung diseases led us to hypothesize that after ETI, highly diseased regions would remain infected, the less diseased regions would clear, and inflammation would be localized to the infected regions. In order to test this hypothesis, we used bronchoscopy to study lung regions to e lung, lung responses to ETI in mildly and severely diseased areas. We identified the two highest and three lowest damaged lung segments with CT scans and then sampled these five regions via bronchoscopy before and a year and a half after subjects started ETI. We used new disposable bronchoscopes to sample each region 
And in all, we were able to study nine adults who came into the study with chronic pseudomonas lung infections. Now, we reasoned that there were multiple characteristics that could contribute to infection persistence. And so we measured several different characteristics of lung disease. The first of which is structural lung damage, as this is the most often discussed in this context. However, we also measured inflammation, as both of these could limit ETI-mediated host defense improvements. We then also measured pseudomonas density, bacterial nutrient content, and mucus concentration, as these characteristics could counter ETI-mediated bacterial clearance. Now, the, my hypothesis rests on the premise that lung regions within subjects are different. And so I wanna start by giving you a flavor of how heterogeneous those regions are within a subject. Here, let's see here, there we go. Here along the y-axis, I'm showing you pseudomonas density, and then along the x, I'm showing each of the individual subjects. Each, oh, sorry. Each dot here is one lung region, um, and you can see in this subject, we start with about 100 CFUs per mil in these lung regions and go up to nearly a million CFUs per mil. And this level of heterogeneity was not unique to this subject. We, in fact, found this degree of heterogeneity across most of our subjects. And I don't have time to go through all this data with you, but we also observed marked heterogeneity for lung damage, inflammation, mucus, and nutrients as well. Now, we not only found heterogeneity, but we also found that these disease characteristics, co severe versions of these disease characteristics co-localized to the same regions. So here along the y-axis, I'm showing you pseudomonas density, and then along the x-axis, I'm showing you our lung damage score. And you can see that there's a positive correlation, meaning that regions with higher lung damage also had higher pseudomonas densities. And we found a similar pattern for pseudomonas density here along the y-axis and inflammation along the x, as well as pseudomonas density along the y and mucus along the x. And I'm only showing you these three examples for time reasons, but when we did all of our pairwise comparisons, we found that all of those comparisons showed significant positive correlations. And so this means that regions with high pseudomonas density also had high lung damage, inflammation, mucus, nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. And any or all of these different characteristics could predispose a lung region to bacterial infection persistence. So do the highly diseased regions remain infected while less damaged regions clear? I'm gonna show you one pattern on this slide and then show you the second pattern on the second slide. Here along the y-axis, I'm again showing pseudomonas density, and then we have pre and post ETI along the X. And importantly, this is only one subject's data. And so as I showed you earlier, there is heterogeneity in the starting bacterial densities, but I wanna take this one step further. And we, um, we generated an overall disease score by averaging over bacterial density, lung damage, mucus, nutrients, and inflammation. And so not surprisingly, the regions Sorry, here we go. The regions with the most overall disease also had high, the highest bacterial densities and vice versa for the low. And so we expected that these highly diseased regions would remain infected while the least diseased regions would clear. But that's not what we found. In fact, all of the regions in this subject cleared regardless of the starting lung disease uh, level. And it was not just this subject who followed this pattern, we found it in two additional subjects. Now, I wanna show you the second pattern of infection persistence that we found. So in this case, all lung regions within this subject remained infected, regardless of the starting lung disease. And this was true for other subjects where either all or nearly all of the lung regions remained infected. And again, I'm only showing three people for time, but this was the case for all six of the people who remained infected. And so just to summarize this section of the talk, Lung regions within individuals are remarkably heterogeneous, and severe disease conditions co-localize within the same lung regions. Despite these two facts, infection persisted in all or none of a person's lung regions. In other words, the worst regions could clear if the rest of the person's lungs cleared, and the best regions could remain infected if the rest of the person's lungs remain infected. And we're still working on understanding why, why, why this is the case. Then. However, I now wanna switch gears and talk about inflammation. So ongoing inflammation will likely degrade people's lung function over time, and so we were also interested in how ETI is affecting regional lung inflammation. 
we wanted to start, because of the known um, pro-inflammatory effects of infection, we wanted to start by comparing persistent inflammation in um, regions that had persistent infection compared to those that had cleared infection. Here along the y-axis, excuse me, along the y-axis I'm showing you inflammation and we're using neutrophil elastase here because that marker has been shown to predict future lung function decline in both CF and non-CF lung diseases. Along the X, we have our pre and post ETI time points, and then these are only regions where Pseudomonas persisted. And so you can see that ETI produced a decline in neutrophil elastase concentrations, but nearly all of the lung regions that had persistent Pseudomonas also had persistent inflammation. This is really striking when we compared it to the regions that had eradicated Pseudomonas. So when regions had eradicated Pseudomonas, nearly all of these regions um, also resolved their inflammation. Now we were interested in whether this was a neutrophil elastase specific characteristic, and so we measured 62 additional cytokines. And I'm showing all 62 cytokines along with neutrophil elastase along the x-axis here. Along the y-axis, we have the mean concentration, and then the blue squares represent the mean across regions where Pseudomonas has persisted, and the pink dot, sorry y'all, okay, I don't have a pointer anymore. So the pink dot represents the mean across regions where Pseudomonas has eradicated, and I'm gonna mark any significant differences with a white star. And so if you were to count all of these white stars, you'd find that 33 of our 63 measured cytokines were significantly higher in regions that had persistent pseudomonas. And I wanna highlight that these um, cytokines represent those canonically produced by B cells, T cells, monocytes, epithelial cells. And so this, this association is not neutrophil specific. Additionally, I wanna highlight some of the scale here. So for example, this is IL-1 beta, and IL-1 beta, or sorry, IL-8, and IL-8 was tenfold higher in regions that remained infected compared to regions that had eradicated Pseudomonas. And this tenfold difference was also seen for IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha. And so this suggested to us that the presence of Pseudomonas was associated with ongoing inflammation, but we also wanted to examine the quantitative relationship between infection and inflammation. So here, there we go. Here along the y-axis we have inflammation, and then along the x we have Pseudomonas density. And this is the pre-ETI data because I wanna show you the comparison with the post-ETI data. And so what we found after ETI was that our R squared value markedly increased, which means that this, like the variation away from the line of best fit is markedly reduced, which suggests that Pseudomonas density is a better explainer of neutrophil elastase concentration after ETI. Again, we wanted to know whether this is a neutrophil elastase specific pattern, and so we compared R squared values between our other 62 cytokines and Pseudomonas density. Here I'm showing you each cytokine along the top, and then this is a heat map representation of the R squared values between these cytokines and Pseudomonas density. And then the pre-ETI values are in the top bar, and the post-ETI values are in the bottom bar. And so we found that the R squared values increased for 36 of these cytokines, which suggested that, again, Pseudomonas density can better explain um, various inflammatory markers after ETI. Now I wanna take a second and explain a little bit more what I mean by that. So there are multiple postulated um, inputs into inflammation in CF. So of course we have our toxins from and induced by the pathogens, but other postulated mechanisms include the pro-inflammatory effects of CFTR mutation itself, as well as mucus plugging and hypoxia. And so what we think is that the increased goodness of fit between Pseudomonas and those other cytokines suggests that our other um, pro-inflammatory inputs are diminished after ETI. Now this is a really important question, but also really difficult to address. And so for my last slide, I wanna show you a little bit of data that could shed some light on this. Now in our study, we did not have a good um, measure for the pro-inflammatory effects of CFTR, but as I talked about in the first section of the talk, we do have markers of mucus. And so for this final slide, I wanna ask the question, do mucus and hypoxia contribute to inflammation after ETI? And before I show you that data, I need to give you a little bit of background. And so this is a horribly simplified um, mechanism here where we have um, 
Mucus and mucus plugging lead to epithelial hypoxia. And when epithelia are hypoxic, they produce IL-1 beta in response. And so I'm going to be switching and using IL-1 beta as my primary measure of inflammation along the y-axis here. And then along our x-axis, we have mucus concentrations. And importantly, these dots are only the dot are only the regions where Pseudomonas has been eradicated. And so there's no confounding influence of Pseudomonas in these lung regions. And so what you can see is that there is a range in mucus concentration, and it's associated with a mild increase in IL-1 beta, suggesting that mucus and mucus plugging are still contributing to mild amounts of inflammation after ETI. But what we found was really striking was that when we looked at the regions where Pseudomonas was present, you can see that the overall concentration of IL-1 beta is much higher and the slope is much steeper, which suggests to us that the presence of Pseudomonas can amplify or compound the pro-inflammatory effects of mucus. And so today I wanna to leave you with two key takeaways. First, despite intralung heterogeneity, infection generally persisted in all or none of a subject's lung regions. And this suggests that lung function will likely degrade globally across the lung as opposed to having that um, ongoing damage localized to a specific region. Additionally, Pseudomonas is strongly associated with inflammation after ETI. For example, Pseudomonas-free regions had undetectable neutrophil elastase and other cytokines were significantly lower. Additionally, the goodness of fit between Pseudomonas and many other cytokines increased post-ETI, which suggests a reduction in other pro-inflammatory inputs. And all of this suggests to us that we need to have continued development of anti-infection strategies, despite the current health benefits of modulators. And with that, I'd really like to thank a ton of people here. Um, this is a huge undertaking. And so first of all, thank you to Pradeep Singh, my primary mentor for my PhD. It was really awesome to get to work with you and I appreciate your confidence in letting me lead such a, a big study. Additionally, I need to thank the UW clinical and Iowa clinical teams for responsible for getting all of these BAL samples for us, as well as the many different research teams that contributed to the primary data I showed here. Um, and then I just want to highlight again, I'm currently down at Emory in Ben Kopp's lab, and this is my updated information, because I learned recently I'm very hard to contact right now, so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sorry, I'm at poster number two, if you have any further questions after the Q&A. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay. Going to ask. Ask. Great talk. Um, have you looked at what happens to the anti pseudomonas antibodies in the segments that seem to have reduced inflammation and also C3A and C5A? Because complements probably involved in the uh, ASCA as well. That, that's, a, that's a great question. We've not looked at any of those kinds of proteins yet, but it would be really interesting to look at. Uh, thanks, very nice uh, talk and interesting data. Thank you. So you very much zoomed in on Pseudomonas, but we know that it's quite a complex uh, soup down there in our CF patients. So, so how about these other bacteria, especially Staph, which is kind of the number two? Yeah, no, thank you so much. So six of our subjects were co-infected co -infected with Staph aureus, so we are also able to look at the regional persistence of Staph aureus. And in that case, we found three of our subjects cleared it from all their regions. And in the other three subjects, most of the regions remained infected. And so it followed a very similar pattern to Pseudomonas. Um, and then we didn't have any other pathogens in this study. The second question, if I may. Yeah. Um, as, so there's quite a, uh, you, you showed the heterogeneity, but there's also quite a bit of heterogeneity in lung disease and CF. Where some patients have very reg regional diseases and others not. Did you pre-select your patients in the sense that they actually had significant regional disease? Yeah, yeah. So we, all of these subjects are young adults, ages 25 to 40, and then we made sure that they had some reduction in lung function, and so we picked patients who had about 60% to 80% FEV, so we would get some lung disease, but it was still safe to do bronchoscopy. Um, but did, some, uh, did they also have areas where there was clearly no bronchiectasis or no damage? Because, I mean, if you look at this population, which already has significant disease, it might be still di quite diffuse throughout the lung. Um, we didn't pre-select on that, but we looked at lung damage heterogeneity within subjects, and nearly all of the subjects had areas that were close to the top of the Brody score and also close to the bottom of the Brody score. So it's a very good question. Thank you.
Hi, really lovely talk. Thank you. Um, when we PCR for Pseudomonas, in all of our samples, we find Pseudomonas present in very low titer. You've got lovely correlations with inflammation now. Can we use that to identify what constitutes the presence of Pseudomonas that we need to treat and below which, which we do not need to treat? That's, yeah, that's a really fascinating question. I think the key would be knowing how much inflammation is acceptable. Um, but yes, we also have uh, PCR-based, um, uh, like DNA-based concentrations as well, so we could add that in there. And yeah, if we knew what level of inflammation was acceptable, you could absolutely do that from the study. You know, again, caveats of small numbers, but yeah. Thank you. Hey, Sebastian. Hi, Samantha. Great job as always. So my question is about your model with the hypoxia yeah. that you mentioned about mucus accumulation inducing hypoxia in epithelial cells and that triggering IL-1 beta. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, I just want to know what, what you think or what you're, um, about the role of neutrophils in that pathway. Because normally IL-1 beta, um, as you said, neutrophils are very important in inflammation and neutrophils are very good inducers or promoters of IL-1 beta. And hypoxia normally is associated with the dysfunction in the mitochondria. And the cells that are get, uh, get impacted by epoxy mostly and by mitochondrial regulation are neutrophils. So do you think that neutrophils are also playing a significant role in your mucus accumulation more than epithelial cells in where the IL-1 beta is mostly produced by NF-kappa B, which is different than inflammasome? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I guess I would say that in the regions that had eradicated pseudomonas, we don't find neutrophil elastase, and so that might suggest that there is fewer neutrophils present in those regions. Um, but I think that's a very interesting question, and I definitely don't have a, a, a good answer for you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sam, I have a question for you. Oh, so Jay uh, kind of ask, asked about the antibodies. Uh, um, did you look at the immune cell profiling, those different regions of the lung? <laughs> no, we didn't look at the immune cell populations. Uh, we, we were definitely focused on um, the bacteria, but I, we do have cell pellets saved, so it's possible that we could go back and do um, some sort of like single nucleus. Yeah, okay, 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 good. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Thank you. I thought, yeah, I was a little afraid because we would already frozen them and hadn't sorted them. Oh, okay. okay, cool. Thank you. Hi, Paul McNally from Dublin. Uh, fantastic talk. Thank you. So, it was really, really in-depth data, but obviously that required bronchoscopy and BAL, and ultimately we'd love to get to a situation where you can do this non-invasively. I'm interested in your CTs. Did you just look at Brody's score on them? No, uh, you have a cohort that you did um, pragma scoring on more, more kind of in-depth scoring. It'd be interesting to, you know, with your kind of pseudomonas persistence and non-persistence, is that type of thing that you can pick up regionally on CT scanning? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we ultimately used three different scoring me uh, metrics. We used Brody score based on a segmental um, delineation, but then we also used um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to blank. So Vita score out of Iowa. And then we also used the, like the um, Therona's lung. Um, lung Q. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I, I don't think it's pragma, right? Because pragma's on the whole lung. But, um, but yeah, so we've used all three. Um, and then when we, we have done some analyses about like which regions cleared infection and which ones didn't. Um, and the thing that came out of that was that air trapping by both Vita's metrics and by Brody's metrics um, appears to be lower in the regions that ultimately eradicated Pseudomonas. Yeah, excellent Great. question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. With this, we finish uh, this talk. If you have any questions, please uh, ask her. And uh, we can also have uh, questions here on the, on the app. Uh, okay. So let's welcome our next speaker, uh, Laura Schopp uh, from Charité University of Berlin, and the title of her talk, Integrative Computational Analysis of Longitudinal Effect of ETI on Sputum Microbi uh, Microbiome and Proteome in Patients with Cystic Fibrosis. Such a big audience. Great. Um, 
Thanks. Yeah, my name is uh, Laura. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today and to share with you some of our very recent um, results of the computation analysis of longitudinal effects of ETI therapy on the sputum microbiome and proteome in patients with uh, CF. I have nothing to disclose. So the data I'm going to talk about today um, and on which we have based this uh, computation analysis was uh, generated as part of a German national-wide um, multi-center study called Module HCF, um, which is a very comprehensive observational study um, in, this, in a post-approval setting. And we have analyzed the multiple um, different outcome measures as depicted here on the bottom of the slide. And in, in, the store, in, the, in this study, I'm I'm focusing here. Um, we were interested in how ETI um, affected sputum properties in adolescent and adult patients within one year of treatment. And in the next couple of slides, I will really go through um, the core findings uh, that we are kind of on the same page and to spend a bit more time on the uh, results of the computation analysis. So in the study, we um, included 10 healthy individuals and 75 patients with CF and examined rheological properties, the airway microbiota composition, airway inflammation, and also the proteome um, signature in after one, three, and 12 months um, of ETI initiation or after ETI initiation. And looking at viscoelastic properties, um, we saw that after one month of ETI therapy, we, we um, saw no changes in elasticity or viscosity in sputum. But after three months of therapy, we um, see a significant decrease in, in elasticity and viscosity, which was sustained after 12 months of therapy. For the mesh process, we saw or behaved correspondingly so we see here a gradual increase in size with ETI therapy. And to have a bit better visualization of how these pores look like, I also brought some electron microscopy images. On the bottom here is a CF, which is really dense and really small pores when we compare it to healthy sputum. Um, ETI also affected the composition of the airway microbiota. And here we could observe a general shift towards the healthy condition, here exemplified by alpha diversity, which also nicely increased with time of treatment. In line, um, ETI also reduced airway inflammation. Um, so levels of key inflammatory markers like IL-1 beta and IL-8 were significantly decreased with therapy um, and were sustained also after one year of therapy and um, also neutrophil protease activity, here for example free neutrophil elasticity and also membrane bound any activity were significantly decreased with ETI therapy. Lastly, we also investigated the sputum proteome um, signature and from this very busy heat map you can already appreciate just to look at the colors that we also see a shift from CF baseline to the healthy conditions with ETI. And um, our previous finding was also supported by uh, geo term analysis. Um, here we found proteins that belong to um, immune um, activity pathway or immune pathways like uh, neutrophil activation or mediated immunity were less abundant um, in response to ETI therapy. And quite interestingly, we observed also that proteins belonging to um, targeting to the membrane or to the endoplasmatic reticulum were increased, which we believe or possibly um, also corresponds to CFDR correction. Now, although I showed you all these um, beneficial Im or these improvements in the viscoelastic properties in the microbiome, proteome, and also airway inflammation levels close to healthy were still not reached after one year of therapy. And we think that this residual um, airway infection inflammation persists at a level that uh, contributed to progressive lung damage, indicating that there is still no need for novel anti-infective and anti-inflammatory uh, therapies. And if you take one step um, back before it comes to really the development of those novel um, therapeutic strategies, 
um, we think we, it's important to understand a bit better the interplay between um, residual area infection and inflammation in people treated with highly effective modulator therapy. And we believe bioinformatics is a quite powerful tool that can support to reach this goal. And um, that is why we have initiated a um, integrative computation analysis um, across these three data sets, so having the clinical data, the microbiomics, and the proteome, and um, with a big goal then hopefully to identify novel biomarkers and therapeutic targeting for persisting airway infection and inflammation. And in order to do this very complex bioinformatic analysis, uh, we were very happy that we could team up with um, Sophia Frostlund group, which is also, or her group is also located at Charity, and her um, postdoc Rebecca, who mainly worked on this project now with us. And so we basically handed over our um, data set with over 20 different um, outcome measures, and then she subsequently integrated the microbiome with the proteome in a, in a complex analysis. And in a very first approach, we wanted to see if we could um, identify clinical correlates that um, contributed to the shifts in the microbial composition. And further, if we could then like have these, mic if those microbiome features would correlate with the abundance of certain proteins. And then lastly, also maybe identify pathways that were associated to certain taxa. And um, so let me start by the microbiome. So um, Rebecca analyzed it um, again in their established workflows and um, applied then PEMANOVA testing um, on that. And very broadly speaking, and those who are not familiar with that, it's basically a statistical test that um, calculates the variance in between different microbiomes um, based on the distances in a multidimensional um, space. and that can be visualized in that principal coordinate analysis that you can see on the left side. Um, and now it has a, our data set is mainly distinguishing by time point and in comparison to healthy controls. And this can be visualized even better, or you can see it um, maybe even better in the plot on the right side. So we see definitely um, differences from CF baseline, so before ETI initiation, and at follow-up visits, but even after one year of treatment, the microbiome or composition or the variance was still very different to healthy controls, meaning that we still have a dysbiotic uh, microbiota composition after one year of ETI treatment. Now we then continued and wanted then also to integrate then the clinical metadata with the microbiome. And um, for that, Rebecca used univariate permanova testing. So this here um, is single comparison. So here on the bottom, you can see all the clinical or biomarker or clinical outcome measures from the 20, we, or more than 20, we have measured. So those were the ones that significantly contributed to the variance of the different microbiomes we have observed. And these in our data set were mainly viscoelastic properties or rheological markers and inflammatory markers. Now in the next step, Rebecca then did this in a multi-comparison setting um, as a combined PEMANOVA. And we ended up then there with those four main um, biomarkers that truly contributed um, to the explained variance in the microbiome we observed with ETI um, therapy which were mesh pore size, um, sweat chloride free NE and CAT G activity. We then also investigate correlations between the microbiome, so between taxa, which you can see on the left side, and then with the biomarkers and the clinical outcomes. And what you get is then this very busy heat map. Don't worry, I won't go into detail. I just I want to depict it here because it nicely shows what we could observe like a pathogenic and commensal signature, like we termed it. And for example, pathogenic bacteria negatively correlated with mesh pore size and lung function and positively with uh, inflammation and viscoelastic properties. And the commensals have uh, roughly the opposite um, correlations. And as last part, we still had the proteome data set, which we also wanted to integrate. And before that, um, we could do that. We um, needed to do first a re dimension reduction analysis and um, by 
doing that, we were able to roughly identify 150 proteins um, that contributed to, um, to these uh, two principal components that you can see also in this coordinate analysis, quite very similar I showed you for the microbiome data, distinguishing mainly um, the different proteome signatures by time point and in comparison to healthier controls. So here again, we can see clearly shifts um, between CF baseline and with follow-up visits. But even after one year of ETI therapy, it was still very different to the healthy control. And we then, then also uh, this correlation analysis also done very, I just also showed it here because also here when we combined um, the bacteria that channels to with the protein data, we can also observe this commensal and pathogenic signature. And um, as last slide, I want to show you, we focused here a bit more on the bacteria protein association and, and especially on the pathogenic um, bacteria and try to match them with geobiological processes. And we use this alluvia protein to show these connections. So on the left side, you have um, the bacteria, the genus, and how they connected to the protein. And then finally, the biological process those proteins belong to. And in summary, we noticed that, again, this pathogenic bacteria primarily associated with inflammatory processes and host immune response. So I uh, come already to the end of my talk. So, um, so far I could um, hopefully show you that we could identify with these integrative computation analysis, we could identify factors that are associated with uh, shifts in microbiota composition. And in our data set, these were mainly viscoelastic acid properties and inflammatory markers. We could definitely see uh, relationships between commensal and pathogens with specific biomarkers or clinical outcome measures, which we designated as commensal and pathogen signature. And um, we could also um, link um, specific biological processes to certain taxa. Like I showed you on the last slide, for example, key CF pathogens were ma mainly linked to inflammatory um, processes. But I want to highlight that this analysis is still ongoing, so I think we still need to understand a bit more the very complex um, microbiome proteome connection and hopefully to break it down then also to yeah, single proteins or pathways that are linked to residual um, inflammation and infection in people treated with highly affected modulator therapy. And um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, I also want to take quickly the time to thank all my co-workers in the MAL lab and especially our cooperation partner who made significant contribution to this work, so especially Rebecca, who's done most on the bioinformatics analysis. And I'm also happy to discuss any more details in tomorrow's poster session. I have poster 21, and thanks again for listening. Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Hi, thanks for your talk. Quite, quite a complex analysis. Yes. So I was wondering how you analyzed the clinical data. Did you look at a given time point or did you look at the deltas and change? Because uh, no. I mean, lung function per se, well, if you take lung function, for instance, your baseline lung function will likely affect your visco. Mm -hmm the link to, to many of these markers like viscoelastic properties. Yeah. That is one subsequent analysis we want to do now. She basically put everything together. So we have for every time point a, the, the measured biomarker or clinical outcome. She has the whole table and now she um, put in the analysis all basically time points together. But then it comes, but this is definitely a very good question. Yeah, too. Thanks. We have a couple of questions from on the app. Okay. <laughs> it says, could you clarify which part of the lung is the microbiome collected from? And is this analyzed from sputum samples? If so, are most bacteria associated with the upper airway nasal area? 
Uh, yes, so these are also all from sputum samples. Um, so it's probably upper airways. We cannot really clearly, you know, identify, but it's all expectorated sputum samples, mm -hmm. those analysis. Yeah. Another one is, do you plan to eventually enroll patients that have received the latest? No, I'm sorry. There was... Sorry, the app is mixing up the questions. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, so for how many of the included patients did you retrieve sputum? This is like a three-part question. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, maybe you can go back to the detail. I, um, I mean, the most we see after three um, months, and it was reduced um, after, so we had, um, after one year, 45 um, patients that we included because we wanted to have paired measurements, though all these patients have a baseline measurement and a follow-up with it. Following up, um, and, could it, and could it be possible that from the patients that you did get sputum are a group that are more pro-inflammatory pro compared to the patients who do not produce sputum? Um, yes, so this, this is um, probably also what you can maybe assume as the limitation of this study, so we focus probably with and um, because we see or we investigated ad adult and adolescent patients, so probably they have already established lung disease or, yeah. And lastly, uh, do you think this might influence your conclusions on the anti-inflammatory effect of ETI? Um, I mean, we see a reduction in inflammation also in patients that have established lung disease, but this would um, is also in my mind maybe to to do the subsequent or sub study analysis to really see patients that have higher levels after one year and how they you know connect it mm -hmm. yeah to bacteria or yeah proteome signature yeah. hi um from the from the clinic we're seeing ongoing changes on chest x-ray for more than a year for two or for three years so do you need another time point yeah, but I think it's, it's also, um, we, we do also still follow up with it. Um, of course, they expectorate less sputum, that's making it hard, although you can, we try to convince our patients, I mean, I'm not a clinician, but we try also to, to induce sputum, I mean, you can get sputum also from healthy people, um, but uh, yeah, we're still having this follow up with it, yeah, but unfortunately not yet included in the analysis. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I think I have a question to your PAMANOVA analysis. So um, you could show that like over the time with the CF treatment the, that you see some significant changes, but you also have different number of samples between baseline and the later time points. Did you, um, did you consider that? Because the, the circles were still like largely overlapping, right? And yeah, I think that just like yeah. the variation at the larger, later time points might yeah. decrease. That is what I try to do now or to convince Rebecca. Sometimes it's very difficult because the smaller sample size, then less you know, significance you have. And so that's why she put like all together and follow it up. But um, we, we, I still want her to do this really per time point comparison and to see how it looks there. Yeah, thank you. Maybe you could do some like bootstrapping or subsampling to have yeah. like to equal out the different yeah. sample numbers. Yeah, I'm happy to discuss any more today. I forward it to you. <laughs> I'm also not by informatician, but uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, thanks. Every advice is welcome. <laughs> and another question Did you consider doing metagenomic shotgun analysis? Um, uh, we did, um, but then we stick um, to the 16S because we had it like in our previous sample to have it matched. But yeah, we, we yeah, it's, let's see if we can do it. Yeah, but it's in, on the list. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Okay. So thank you very much for your talk. And Just a, a little bit of housekeeping on the app is mixing up the questions. Can you, uh, if you're going to type a question, please, for and the name of the speaker so we can, uh, don't get confused with the questions here. Thanks. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, uh, Raul. Uh, he's uh, discussing the effect of ETI treatment on metabolic shift on cystic fibrosis neutrophils.
Hi, thank you so much for attending. Uh, I'm with the Partida Sanchez Lab at Nationwide Children's Hospital and uh, I'm in the junior investigator category. Uh, so there are no, this is a disclaimer and we don't have any disclosures in our lab. Uh, canonically, neutrophils have been co uh, attributed to be the main drivers of inflammation and infection and damage in the lung, mainly because upon infection of opportunistic pathogens, uh, epithelial cells, they release uh, cytokines to recruit neutrophils. And the neutrophils are able to transmigrate to the infection side. They uh, have reduced uh, bacteria killing capabilities, meaning that the infection will remain, and these will recruit more neutrophils, perpetuating a cycle of inflammation and, and damage. We think that this is a multifactorial dysfunction, meaning that we have intrinsic defects on the, on the neutrophil uh, from people with CF that can be related to iron imbalances, different populations, uh, neutrophils, uh, immature neutrophils, but also they acquire this uh, green fade uh, they downregulate some important factor genes, and also they increase their survival. So we think uh, the defect in neutrophils might be just a contribution of a lot of things uh, happening on the CF lung at the point of the infection. And in our lab, we have shown that uh, CF neutrophils uh, from blood, they have reduced antimicterial activity against uh, different opportunities pathogens important for CF. Uh, they also have reduced ROS generation, which is a very important mechanism to trigger another effector mechanisms in neutrophils. And as well as the release of nets, these web-like uh, structures that can trap bacteria and also are uh, somewhat drivers of inflammation in the lung. Uh, with the advent of ETI uh, treatment, uh, we have seen that uh, there are very good clinical outcomes right now. There are less infections, there are less cough episodes. Uh, but there are still some limitations. And one of those is that the research on the effect on ETI or any other modulators in neutrophils, it's still an open field. There are very few information about how ETI influences the mechanisms on these very important cells in, in the CF environment. So the main question that we have in our lab is that uh, by the defect on the CFTR, there is an accumulation of chloride, but there are compensatory ions like calcium and sodium that are going inside the cell. And these can disrupt uh, the signaling pathways that can improve uh, the effector mechanisms. And the question that we have is that if with ETI, we can rescue these ion imbalances and improve how these neutrophils can effectively kill bacteria. Uh, first, we wanted to test uh, important effector functions on neutrophils, which will, will be the restoration of the antimicrobial activity in vitro, which shows Percodera of Sepatia as our model of infection. As we can see over here, uh, non-CF neutrophils, they respond a little bit on uh, the treatment with EI, but more importantly, when we tested uh, CF neutrophils before and after the ETI treatment, uh, we see that uh, ex vivo neutrophils, just the ones that we have uh, from blood, they do have recovered antimicrobial capacity in vitro. And this is actually uh, increased when we uh, test uh, ETI in vitro with these neutrophils. We also uh, have found that the generation of ROS, uh, even at before uh, ETI treatment, uh, has been increased in these neutrophils in, in vitro. Uh, these are ex vivo neutrophils, I'm sorry. So uh, meaning that they have more capabilities to start triggering effector uh, functions. Another important uh, uh, function of neutrophils is the uh, re uh, release of the netosis, the release of nets. Uh, as we can see over here, when we stained uh, DNA, uh, non-CF neutrophils can produce these web-like structures and trap bacteria, and CF uh, cells can uh, interact with bacteria, but they don't really uh, create these webs uh, or spread them out. Uh, but in treatment with ETI, we found that if we prime these cells, with ETI and use PMA to activate them, we have a very, very widespread um, web of nets that um, this can be uh, correlated with more bacteria being trapped there and being killed. So these basic functions, the generation of ROS, netosis, and also back intercellular bacteria killing uh, being improved by ETI means that the, there is a defect in CF neutrophils. Uh, and this is driven because of the CFDR. Uh, this function. 
And uh, many of these mechanisms, uh, effector mechanisms, are governed by the uh, production of ROS by the NOx2 enzyme. This is a multi-complex cytoplasmatic uh, uh, protein that upon activation, uh, it gets uh, congregated in the plasma membrane to start producing the, the ROS. So one of the questions they wanted to address here is that is, are there um, these functions in the assembly or is the activation of the NOx2 uh, what is being not working in, in CF neutrophils? Uh, we did a kinetic of P47 phosphorylation, which is one of the first steps to start the, the activation of the uh, NOx2 complex. Uh, we did this by Western blood. So the more uh, intense bands that we see with the phosphorylated antibody, the more activation that we have of the enzyme. So we found that CF neutrophils, uh, they really do not actually uh, have a lot of uh, phosphorylation, so their en enzyme is not being assembled effectively. But when we, uh, at ETI in vitro, we have shown that, and we have seen that there is a restoration on the activation of the enzyme. There is more phosphorylation, meaning that there is more enzyme that is being uh, activated to generate this ROS. So um, one of the questions, that, another of the questions that we had is, is uh, the assembly is what is being dysfunction, that we see that there's dysfunctions in the assembly, but also uh, is the activation of the enzyme, and uh, there is a very tight, um, relationship between ETI, uh, between, I'm sorry, the activation of uh, NADPH and metabolism, mainly because uh, when glucose enters the uh, neutrophils, uh, it can go to glycolysis, which is the main uh, source of energy in neutrophils. But these metabolites, they can go to another pathway that is called the pentose pathway, that these generates huge amounts of NADPH, especially in neutrophils. And these fuels the NOx2 enzyme to generate uh, NOx the, to generate the ROS. Uh, so we wanted to test different steps on these metabolic pathways on neutrophils. Uh, first, we wanted to see if there are differences between the uptake of glucose. So we use a, gluco a fluorescent glucose analog to test if CF neutrophils have downregulated uh, glucose uptake. We found that uh, in a very early stages, uh, kinetic uh, stages, very early stages. Uh, CF and non-CF uh, cells do not have really differences between uh, in glucose uptake when we stimulated them with Burkholderia sinusopatia. However, uh, we did see some uh, trends of uh, CF neutrophils having lower uh, glucose uptake uh, even when we were stimulated after one hour with this uh, glucose analog. So uh, being having less glucose, uh, the neutrophils having less glucose, is this affecting uh, uh, downstream uh, glycolysis or another um, metabolic pathways. So uh, we use a seahorse uh, technology uh, to correlate the generation of uh, lactic acid, the last step of glycolysis, uh, to test if we have a higher or lower glycolytic rate. So before each patients with ETI, we found that uh, upon stimulation with EAPMA, there we have very similar uh, glycolytic rates, but after uh, a patient has been on their ETI for at least two years in this case. Uh, glycolytic rates have uh, shifted from not being uh, very active to a very active glycolytic rate. And this can, can be correlated uh, with the activation of the NOx2 enzyme uh, and the generation of NADPH because uh, neutrophils can uh, recycle these metabolites from glycolysis and cycle them through the pentose pathways away so they can have a lot of NADPH being produced. And as a proof of concept, we uh, wanted to inhibit the uh, key enzyme, uh, which is a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, uh, to see if we can have or evidentiate that effect of uh, CF neutrophil uh, on the activation of the pentose pathway. Uh, we found that the generation of ROS uh, on CF neutrophils, it's uh, lower or comparable uh, with C the generation of ROS of CF neutrophils uh, just without the inhibition of the pentose pathway is similar to when we inhibited the uh, pentose pathway in healthy donor neutrophils. And this is more, more, a lot more marked when we inhibit um, the pentose pathway in CF neutrophils, meaning that uh, there is uh, neutro CF neutrophils lack some mechanisms to, or there are different uh, uh, signaling pathways that are not driven, not driving uh, glucose to the pentose pathway. And this was uh, shown here 
when we inhibited the, uh, this enzyme and then we tested their antimicrobial activity uh, against Burkhardera sinocepatia. So we also found that uh, their antimicrobial activity is reduced and it's actually uh, not statistically significant when we, if we inhibit it or we do not inhibit the pentose pathway in CF neutrophils, uh, meaning that neutrophils are having some defects on shifting uh, some of the metabolites from glycolysis to pentose pathway and they're not, uh, might not be generating enough ROS to trigger their effector functions. Uh, future perspectives that we have, uh, we are trying to establish some metabolomic analysis to really analyze uh, where are these metabolites going, if they're going through the pentose pathway or if they're going to TCA or another uh, cycles. Uh, there's also a lot of work um, in uh, transmigration models from Rabin's lab in Emory uh, where they actually see the defect of neutrophils, uh, this is an in vitro model, after transmigration. So uh, what we think is that we are CF neutrophils, they do have an interesting defect. However, this effect is potentiated when they transmigrate and this uh, is having um, these uh, impaired antimicrobial um, mechanisms in CF. So the conclusions for our work is that uh, CFTR deficiency promotes an intrinsic defect in neutrophils effector functions and that the assembly <clears throat> and production of ROS by the NOx2 are deficient in CF neutrophils. Uh, these cells exhibit the quiescent metabolism and that if we restore the CFTR function by ETI, uh, these may help to reestablish bacterial clearance and reduce inflammation. So the takeaway message that um, I have from my presentation is that C neutrophils are one of the main drivers of tissue damage in CF. However, ETI is having less infections. They're making them kill better. So if there's no bacteria in the lung, there's no need for neutrophils uh, being in the lung. So having their antibacterial uh, mechanisms reestablished, uh, this is uh, what is, we think that is lower inflammation and infection in the CF environment. Uh, lastly, I want to acknowledge uh, my lab, my lab members, and also our collaborators, and NIH, also the Curistic Purposes Columbus, uh, our C3 group in Columbus, Ohio and also the Mexican Council of Human and Science Technologies. And uh, you can visit our posters for more information. Uh, mine is 355 and one of the co-authors of the, of the information is Alejandra, it's 355 and mine is 34. And with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm pleased to answer them. Hi. Hi. A very interesting talk, and I have a purely mechanistic question. So in your model system, you also use non-CF, right? Yes. And you did it with ETI? Yes. Uh -huh. And you also showed a slight upregulation of the activity, and I can't help but wonder if it's either capture that does the trick here, since CFTR is already uh, corrected, and this potentiates the chloride transport. So. Yes. Uh, in some results that we have from our lab, uh, we've seen that either capture it's the most active in, in neutrophils. Uh, there is very few information about CFTR biogenesis in neutrophils per se, so uh, we think that there is CFTR trapped in the ER and uh, Tessa captor and Alexa captor might be pushing it up, but it's already pre-made. We don't think that there is need de novo CFTR synthesis. So CFTR is actually, uh, Eva captor would think it's actually, is the one, the main driving force of, of this and also uh, we want to have more information, and this is a future perspective as well. Maybe there is a CFTR-related chlorination in phagolysosomes, uh, but that's, that's another whole, a whole other story. So Ibacaptor might be actually working on these uh, phagolysosomes. Yeah, uh, question one, uh, Luis and Estate. Um, interesting talk. Um, so the CGD um, has the NOx2 uh, deficiency. Mm -hmm and uh, which apparently has a much more severe disease. So have you compared your deficient or, you know, apparently CF is only have uh, like an infection, you know, in the lung, but not in the, in the circulation. And how could, could you compromise like a, or, you know, um, deliberate more, you know, about your defect? Unfortunately, we, we haven't tested anything on CGD. Uh, we know that there are some uh, knockout mice that we can use as a model of work, but not, we haven't tested uh, in our lab something about that. But there are really marked differences between CG, CGD and, and CF. Thanks. 
Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, I'm actually, I have two questions. The first one is related to the fact that if you block the, the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, you reduce, of course, the amount of NADPH produced by the oxidative phase of the PPP. And uh, you observe as an effect the increase in ROS, correct? A reduction. It, it, it was a reduction. There was a reduction. Was so a reduction. Uh, my question was, uh, what about the glutathione role in this? Because NADPH is one of the main substrates used for the recovery of the uh, reduced form of mm -hmm. oxidated form of the glutathione. Uh, yes, uh, great question. And uh, I think you're nailing on the things that we're trying to do in the future. We, we don't really have information about glutathione. Uh, but it will be very interesting to see if there are um, antioxidant effects of ETI in, in, in well, in neutrophils is the cells that we have, but also in macrophages and other cells because uh, these cells are inflammatory per se. So it will be very interesting to see how these antioxidant mechanisms is work are working in, in, in these cells. Yeah. And the second one is uh, related to the fact that you measure the glycolytic activity uh, in the formation of lactate. Mm -hmm. Lactate is formed uh, during the anaerobic uh, glycolysis. And do, this means that these cells do mainly anaerobic glycolysis and what is the impact of the TCA cycle in this process? Mm -hmm. Uh, second question first. Uh, we measured the uh, activation of TCA cycle in neutrophils. I actually, it's in my poster. <laughs> so I didn't have much time to put it here. Uh, we didn't see a lot of activation of TCA cycle in, in neutrophils. Uh, just by biology, neutrophils don't really have a lot of mitochondria. So TCA cycle was very, very uh, reduced. Also because TCA cycle since start from the complex one of the mitochondria, is strongly involved in the production of R or S, a yes. species of oxygen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. are impaired. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, it will also be impaired. So, so great talk. Um, whenever I think about neutrophil net formation, I also think about rates of spontaneous apoptosis because it's really a balance between those. So just as a simple fundamental question, what is the impact of ETI or CFTR restoration on uh, spontaneous apoptosis rates within neutrophils because that is also significantly dysregulated at baseline, depending on which model you look at. And is it just that mixture? Is it just sort of endogenous lifespan? This is just sort of a lead time bias within your cell culture model with ETI restoration? Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, so um, with neutrophils, is they're very prone, to, they're, they get prime and they die. Right. Uh, Comparing the different sites, like for apoptosis or necroptosis or other forms of death, has been a little bit difficult for our lab and other labs that we have uh, read some information. So I don't really have a clear answer really on that on that question. But uh, I think on neutrophils, it's really interesting to see where what is the the point that of no return on netosis or going to apoptosis or pyroptosis, perhaps uh, if there is a lot of IL-1 beta. Um, but how neutrophils die, I think that's, an, that's another whole project. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Hey, very nice talk. Um, Dan Argides from Dartmouth. You already partially answered my question, but um, so I study macrophages primarily, and we've seen in vitro that the Alexa cafter uh, in particular inhibits oxidative phosphorylation in macrophages. I know you said that neutrophils don't have a lot of ox oxidative phosphorylation um, sort of at baseline, but I'm just wondering if there's some kind of connection between those two effects and whether, I know that you showed the data of kind of the post-EDI patients, but did have you also looked at sort of if you give them ETI in vitro, what that does to the metabolism in the neutrophils? Um. With Alexa Cafter, uh, we found that it's the milder, it has a milder effect than Tessa Cafter. Uh, Eva, Eva Cafter is the one that actually, we think that is doing a lot of the, of the job there. Interesting. Mm. That's the complete opposite of what I saw, but it's a different cell type, so it, <laughs> fascinating. It's, it's a, yeah, uh, this is an in vitro study, yeah. so we can tweak a little bit and have uh, better ways of reading the, the experiments that we have, but uh, cool. we're open to everything. Thank you. There are a couple of questions from the app. 
One is just like uh, technical questions. Uh, how did you measure growth uh, when examining the effect of ETI on the production of neutrophils? How did you examine a measure ROS? Uh, we, we use uh, luminal, so we use measuring general ROS production. And the next, que next question is um, very interesting talk. Uh, are there any aspect uh, of the NOx uh, uh, to assembly that you have looked at, uh, um, at to confirm the outside P47? Yes, uh, we tested P40 phosphorylation as well. We, we seen that it's uh, impaired. Uh, also, we didn't see any differences on GP91, so uh, like uh, a big difference on CGD, uh, neutrophils, they do have everything ready to assemble. Uh, why they're, it's, they're not being assembled, that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer. But at least uh, P40 and P47, the ones that we have measured, are impaired. If there are not any questions, thank you, Raul. Okay, our next speaker, um, I don't see without glasses, sorry. <laughs> our next speaker, uh, Jing Chu Chen uh, from Columbia University, uh, will discuss highly effective modulated therapy reprogram CF lung cell immunometabolism. Hello, everyone. My name is Jing. In Sun Chen, also go by the name Sam. Uh, I'm a research technician in Dr. Alice Prince and Dr. Re uh, Sebastian Riquelme's lab at Columbia University. And today I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present to you my project on highly effective modulator therapy report on CF lung immunometabolism. Uh, so, for disclosure, I have uh, nothing to disclose for this presentation. So just a quick introduction, everyone knows about CF. Um, cystic fibrosis is caused by the disruption of CATR, which is a chloride exporter. And we know uh, if the, your CATR is disrupted, then your C, um, you will have a reverse uh, equilibrium of water, which causes sick mucus. And that does two things. The one thing is it blocks your airway, so the patient will have more difficulties to breathe. And the second thing is that because mucus contains a lot of nutrients, um, a bacteria can use those nutrients to proliferate in your lung. And primarily in patients with cystic fibrosis, we see mostly uh, Staphylococcus aureus as well as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And some of the most common cytokines are uh, being detected in CF patients um, are IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, and TNF. And those important for the cytokines can uh, induce tissue damage in the lung. Uh, there are several types of CATR mutations uh, from 1 to 6. The most common one is the type 2 mutation. For type 1 mutation, it's caused by the truncation of CATR protein, and the type 2 is the misfolding of the protein. And 3 and 4 are related either to the gating and the conductance of the protein, and 5 and 6 are because causing by the insufficient protein numbers expressed on the membrane of the cell surface. Um, for for patients, uh, we have highly effective module therapy for uh, various CITR mutations. Um, uh, there are about there are roughly two classes of uh, CITR uh, therapies: CITR corrector and CITR potentiator. So, if you look at the the bottom, we have the CITR corrector, including tesacaptor and lexacaptor. Uh, they are primarily used for type two mutation. Uh, they can be also helpful for five and six. As for CATR potentiator, in the top we have Evacaptor, and they are particularly useful for type 3 and type 4 mutations. So, um, if today this person has a normal COTR and, and the person has an invasive pathogen in the airway, the infection can stimulate their airway epithelium and release uh, parenchymal cytokines. And those will recruit uh, phagocytes, and those phagocytes will then release their own cytokines to clear infection. And hopefully by the end of that, you achieve resolution. However, if today this person has a CFTR mutation, the recruited phagocytes would not release enough cytokines to clear the infection, so you don't achieve resolution. And continuous presence of pathogen in the airway will stimulate your airway even more and release even more cytokines and recruit even more immune cells. And those can cause tissue damage as well. And we think all these processes are uh, regulated by the metabolism of the cell. 
And the reason why we say that is we know cells need to generate energy through glycolysis and TCA cycle. Um, so, but what we are saying here is that when you when the cells have a normal effective TCA cycle, uh, they can produce energy through mitochondria, and you achieve a good bioenergetics, and that makes your cell really happy because you have a homeostasis and you have uh, maintained tissue integrity. However, if today your TCA cycle is impaired, um, you don't have a good bioenergetics and the cells are not happy about that because you have a lot of inflammation and inflammation causes tissue damage. So what we are hypothesizing is that the immune dysregulation that we see in, in the CF are actually linked to the TCA cycle alteration. So to study that, we start with the epithelial cells. So for epithelial cell, we use the uh, uh, IB3-1 cell line. So this is a human airway epithelial cell. It has two types of CATR mutation, including uh, the type of mutation, W12A22X, nonsense mutation, as well as the very common type 2 mutation, F504A deletion. Uh, for the wild type cells, we use uh, the adenovector corrected wild type from the IB3 cell, code C38, uh, as our control. So the first thing is that we, we try to see how different cells can generate energy with various metabolites between the CS cell and the wild type cell. So if you see the graph here that when we compare the CS cells to this wild type, um, they have less ability to produce energy through various metabolites. and and they are in, involved in the TCA cycle, including alpha-ketoglutarate, malate, fumarate, succinate, and cis -aconitate. So they have a reduced energy produce, production through the TCA cycle metabolite, and then, so we have to ask the question, what is happening with the TCA cycle metabolites? So we did an intracellular metabolomic to see how different metabolites are accumulated in the CA cells. CF epithelial cells. So if you see the first one here is the pyruvate. Uh, we have the control here, uh, treated with the ETI, uh, with or without infection. Then you see the one on the left, which is in the red, uh, they are the CF epithelial cells. So we can see that in, during, particularly during uh, LPS stimulation, we have a higher accumulation of pyruvate uh, in the CF cell in comparison to the wild type. Uh, well, there is no change in citrate, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinate, but we have an accumulation of, fum of fumarate in the CF cell as well. Uh, no change in malate and no change in oxaloacetate. Um, then we see oh, the, the effect of ETI. We see there is no change in pyruvate, citrate, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinate. However, we see a uh, in reduce in fumarate as well as in malate and there's no changing oxaloacetate. And so it seems like fumarate could be the key to answer our question how if uh, the ETI is driving its effect uh, through fumarate metabolism. Um, so we compare again uh, this, uh, how cells generate energy before, uh, before and after uh, ETI therapy. So this is CF cells treated with uh, ETI. Uh, and we, you can see that here that fumarate has actually increased this time in comparison to the non-treated group. So uh, this is suggesting that EPI, uh, HEMT improves CF epithelial cells to produce energy through TCA cycle. And we want to see what is the effect, uh, the actual effect of the, uh, fumarate in terms of like producing cytokines. So if you see here IL-8, uh, the blue one here again are the wild type cells uh, with or without fumarate or with or without pseudomonas infection. Um, then we have the one on the red, which is uh, the CF epithelial cells. And we can see that uh, during a pseudomonas infection, we can see a marked increase of IL-8, which is the classical signature of CF. Um, and and we see the same pattern with MCP1, IL-6, uh, no change in different gamma, and a, a slight change in uh, TNF alpha. But when, when we uh, add a fumarate, you can see, you can see that both IL-8, MCP1, and IL-6, uh, as well as uh, TNF gamma, uh, dramatically de decrease. So, so this is suggesting that by improving fumarase metabolism in the epithelial cell, we can decrease the pro-inflammatory uh, signature of the CF epithelial cells. 
So just to quickly summarize the first segment of, uh, of this presentation, is that we know uh, the airway epithelial cell has an impaired TC cycle, causing them to not be, be able to produce energy through fumarate. Therefore, your fumarate in, uh, accumulates inside the cell, and it leads, all of these are associated with increased cytokine production. So well, then we answered, uh, if we study this, we also need to answer the question, what is happening to the C of myeloid cells? So to study the myeloid cells, we use this at age of 60, which is a human poor myeloid blast, and, and it has a, this very cool neutral field-like activity. Um, for the CF cell line, we have uh, the, uh, the same cell line with CRISPR-Cas9 homozygous F5.9 gout uh, from the research group from Iowa. Um, then we do the same analysis by comparing how different cells uh, produce energy through various metabolites. We see that the CF uh, myeloid cells, neutrophils, are actually generating more energy through fumarin. Uh, however, when we treat the cells uh, with the ETI, we see that fumarate decrease. So we want, wonder, we're wondering like how that is related to the cytokine production of, of the cell. If the cells is uh, by redu if the ETI is improving cells' ability to uh, produce cytokines, and that is through the fumarate metabolism. So uh, we've we infect the cell with pseudomonas, and we try to see different cytokine production. And the first panel I'm showing here is IL-1 beta. So the one on the one in the blue is our is our wild type H of 60, and the blue and the red here is the delta F 508 of the same H of 60 cells. We see that in CF there are actually less production of IL-1 beta uh, in comparison to the wild type. However, when we give the uh, the cells ETI therapy, uh, that cytokine uh, IL-1 beta actually increase. Again, we see the same pattern with IL-6. Uh, it increased with the CF cells, and it increased after the ETI therapy, uh, TNF-alpha, uh, interferon gamma, as well as IL-10. So what we're saying here is that it seems like in CF immune cells, it has an overactivation of uh, mitochondria and co causing it to produce way more, uh, way more energy uh, with fumarate and that is, lead, that is leading to its uh, decreased production of cytokines and causing it to be immune tolerant. So, uh, so when we just to summarize everything that I just mentioned, including the epithelial cells as well as the CF immune cells, is that in CF, in CF epithelial cells that it has a de uh, decreased impaired TCA cycle, leading it to not be able to produce energy through fumarate, that has uh, leading it to have more cytokine production. However, in the CF Im immune cells, it's the opposite, that it actually has an overactivated TCA cycle and produces way more energy with fumarate, that is causing it to have less cytokine production. And, all, and this dysregulated uh, metabolism can be corrected with HEMT. And this leads to our future research question, including uh, what, what, is, what is the reason or what are the reasons that are causing uh, epithelial cell immune cells to respond differently to infection? And as well as how is HMT modifying energy production through fumarate metabolism? That's a big question that we are trying to answer. And lastly, I think uh, like even more importantly for uh, a uh, clinical question is that how HEM, uh, can HEMT improve bacterial clearance? And uh, lastly, I would like to thank uh, both my mentors, Dr. Alice Prince and Dr. Sebastian Riquelme from Columbia University for giving me this great opportunity to study on this subject, uh, as well as our collaborator Clemente from your School of Medicine. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Calgary Metabolomic Research Facility uh, uh, from University of Calgary and Purdue Omega Metabolomic uh, Core Facility from Welcome Med Medicine for supporting our research. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, we, we want to thank all of our funding bodies to support uh, this research project. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions.
Thanks for a lovely talk, Sam. Um, you mentioned this briefly at the end with one of your last questions, but have you thought about looking at how fumarate specifically affects pseudomonas? I think there's some old literature that shows that it can change its lifestyle from biofilm to planktonic. So I assume that might be one of your future experiments. Yeah, that, oh, we, we know that pseudomonas can consume like fumarate. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, when we are uh, doing the uh, fumarate experiment, uh, we, we always like exclude fumarate when we're infecting them with pseudomonas. So they are only present before pseudomonas infection. Um, and therefore, we, yeah. of, that's a very interesting question and we, we will want to study that in the future as well. Thank you. No, no questions. Uh, great talk. Uh, yeah. Apart from fumarate being a metabolite, it also acts as an antagonist of uh, TET enzymes. Do you see any epigenetics changes in your model uh, that can explain some of these findings? That's, that's a very inter interesting question. Um, um, unfortunately, we, we haven't looked into that, but that will be definitely something that we'll be looking into. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sam, thank you so much for a very interesting and intriguing talk. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment that um, in collaboration with Martina Gant, I'm Carla Ribeiro from UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, we have not been able to find at the level of airway epithelial primary cultures uh, any anti-inflammatory effects of ETI or um, you know, several combinations of HEMT. Um, and these were models in which we utilized delta F508, homozygous cultures um, in presence or absence of pseudomonas co-culture. And the bottom line is that with or without infection in presence of mucopyrulent material from CF airways, we would trigger inflammation, but ETI, again, in vitro in our model, was not able to promote any decrease in IL-8, IL-6, or other types of inflammatory mediators. So I, I, I just try to understand the discrepancy, if you will, between these findings and the findings that we had you know, acquired previously. But it's very interesting, the effect of fumarate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that information. Thank you very much. Yeah. Simon, I have a question. Um, we discussed about a little bit the hypoxic environment in the lung. Did you try to look at your metabolites growing the cells in hypoxia conditions? Uh, we we have we haven't done that, but but that, that's very inter something very interesting for us to test as well. Very nice talk, Sam. Um, in terms of thinking about the role of the epithelial cells and the neutrophils in the cytokine environment, um, this is really more of a kind of philosophical question. But you can imagine early there might be fewer neutrophils, but by you know, people with more advanced disease, the airway is just chock full of neutrophils. Which cell type do you think is influencing the cytokine milieu more, or do you think it's a combination? Do you think the epithelial cell cytokines versus the neutrophil cytokines are changing the environment more? Yeah, I think this this is a very interesting question. I guess like it also depending on the stage of the disease that the patient has. Uh, so in in the early stage, maybe the epithelial cell will have more effect than the neutrophil, and then, as it gets to the later stage, stage the neutrophil will take over then uh, take over the epithelial cells. But um, and so it really depends on what stage we're talking about. If we're talking about later stage, probably. Probably still a mixture of both, but maybe like 80%, 20% for a neutral field to epithelial cells. And do your studies um, give you the ability to look at crosstalk between the two types of cells? Yeah, so we studied them, we studied them separately, but we try, uh, we have put them in the same condition doing the same uh, in vitro experiment for both of them. Um, in, we do, did talk about like in a Perhaps that in future we can have some kind of ways to study them together, but we haven't done that yet. Thanks. Yeah, we have a question from the app. Uh, it says, very nice talk. Uh, the question is, how long was your initial PAO one infections? And have you considered a time, a time course of infection for your last uh, future direction question? Yeah, for the PAO uh, infection, uh, they're infected at NLF10 for, for, an, for an hour. 
Um, for for longer time course, uh, it will be possible, but the pseudo pseudomonas infection at that high dosage is very toxic to the cells. So they you typically don't survive after like three or four hours. And uh, I do have another question. Uh, we are actually working with the HL60 model, and then we found them kind of weird. <laughs> Uh, have you differentiated them for your uh, uh, experiments? Yeah, we have differentiated them for five days uh, until they fu fully differentiate before we do the experiment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, with ARA or with DMSO? Uh, DMSO. DMSO? Yes. So, if there are not any more questions, thank you so much, Sam. And And uh, um, thank you to the speakers for the five fantastic presentation today. And thank you to everyone for attending this workshop. And enjoy the rest of the meeting.